All right, now we're going to continue to build on our skills and understanding of how unemployment works. We just talked about the types of it. We talked about the causes of it, the distribution of it, the costs of it. And now what we're going to do is focus on how to express this thing on a diagram. Now, I showed you a little bit earlier about the labor market diagram. And actually, I gave you a little sneak peek in there about how you would relate like a drop in aggregate demand to a drop in the aggregate demand for labor. Okay, but what... What's going to be really important moving forward is being able to use both the neoclassical aggregate demand and supply diagram and the Keynesian aggregate supply and demand diagram effectively in expressing unemployment. Okay, And in order to do this, what I decided to do was to use two diagrams that come from Eli Tregeges. Eli Tregeges is uh, the chief examiner for the IB uh, economics program, and she put together a great course catalog, or course catalog a great course companion, um, which I would suggest to anybody. Okay, and one of the things that she did here was a really nice breakdown of how you would show cyclical business cycle unemployment or demand deficient unemployment. And I think it's best, as I said before, I really, really, really think it's best to really like focus on this idea of it being demand deficient because that just shows up so obviously when you draw diagrams. Okay, so. These diagrams are a little bit different. They're different than like the rule of 10 that I drew or the rule of nine that I drew, but it's helpful to see different versions of this because when you get to the test, you might see a different version. Now, if you're gonna draw these yourself, I would suggest that you immediately go to the rule of 10 for the neoclassical and you go immediately to the rule of nine for the Keynesian. Okay, nonetheless, let's take a look at this uh, particular diagram. Okay, so the, in the neoclassical diagram, yeah, what do you have? Well, you have price level over here. You got real GDP down here. And where this um, diagram begins is right here with a aggregate demand curve of AD1. So in the beginning, right, and this is what you always have to do, where is the market operating? The market is operating at price level 1 YP. So if it were to do it the way you do it in the rule of 10, this would be Y1 and PL1, okay? But then what happens? There's a drop in aggregate demand. What makes up aggregate demand? You already know that. C plus I plus G plus X minus M. C to the I, to the G, to the bus, to the X minus M. You remember that. And as a result of a drop in consumption, a drop in investment, a drop in government spending, or a drop in the net exports, see how important that is? That's a drop in real GDP, yes. And it's also a drop in aggregate demand because they're the same thing, right? And so as a result, we have a inward shift of the aggregate demand curve to 82. What does that do? That creates a new market equilibrium, right? That's happening right here at pH two Y recession, right? Or Y two. Okay. So this now tells us a lot of stuff. Now, if you look at this diagram, you don't find anywhere where it says, where's the unemployment, but the fact that the op, that the, that the, economy was operating at its full level of full level of employment employment right here at 81 and then aggregate demand dropped then where this demand drops what you have is less output fewer things being made and whenever there are fewer things being made guess what there is increase in unemployment so this would be an example of a recession you would see a drop in output which means an increase in unemployment and you could say over here that the drop in level of PL1 to PL2, this would be an example of deflationary pressure. Always say the part pressure because it might not be sustained. It could be temporary. And deflation is a sustained drop in average price level. So just say deflationary pressure, okay? So in the neoclassical world, that is how you would draw demand deficient unemployment, okay? Now, what about the other one? What about, what about our good friend Keynes? Well, here is his diagram. And where did his story start? Right at the same place, right? Right there at AD1, okay? And where was the economy operating? Right here at PL1, YP. And then this is the same drop in aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, right? And as a result, there is an inward shift of the aggregate demand curve. And as a result, you have a new price combination of PL2, Y rack or Y2, 
right? Why REC, what Elliot Trigegi is there saying is recession. And as a result, what you have is an example of increased unemployment there and increased unemployment there. This is the exact same thing drawn in the two different models. First of all, of course, the monetarist or new classical model, and then secondly, the Keynes model. And this model right here is equally as useful. And as I said later, you know, it depends on how your teacher wants you to teach or how you, not, you're not going to teach. Well, maybe they want you to teach. That'd be cool. But how they want you to draw it. I, I prefer the, um, the neoclassical model because I feel like you have fewer decisions to make about where you draw aggregate demand. Okay, but that's how you would show either business cycle, demand deficient, um, no, no, cyclical unemployment or demand deficient unemployment on either one of those diagrams. Okay, now check out this um, slide right here. This slide kind of like blows your mind. Okay, this was also created by Elliot Trigegis, and this might like put you over the top in terms of information, but. Let me tell you something. If you can just let your mind soak some of this in right now, and if you can get comfortable with the fact that these diagrams, I told you in the beginning, that these diagrams tell you so many stories. They just are the most generous diagrams in all of economics. So let's take a look at, this is Ellie Trigegi's again, and she has an overly simplified um, aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram, and she chose the neoclassical model. Okay, but let's let's take a look at all of the information that is here. Okay, so let's start off right here at the long run aggregate supply curve. Okay, what is happening there at the YP level of output? Listen to this closely; it's so helpful to you. At the YP level of output, we are operating at the potential JD GDP where unemployment rate equals the sum of structural, frictional, and seasonal unemployment. Hey, you know that. What's that? That is the natural rate of unemployment. That's right. That's the natural rate of unemployment. And there is zero cyclical unemployment or zero what? Demand deficient unemployment. So that is 5% unemployment right there at the YP level. That is cool. Okay. Now... If something happens where aggregate demand moves out or the long run aggregate supply curve moves out or the short run aggregate supply curve moves outward and we end up operating somewhere in this realm, somewhere operating right here, right there, guess what? Ooh, follow the line there will be a situation where there's going to be an inflationary gap. There will be zero cyclical unemployment. Unemployment will be less than. Less than what? The natural rate of unemployment. What does that mean? Oh, unemployment below 5%. See why you can't flip around employment, unemployment. You just have to stay with unemployment, stay with unemployment. Below natural rate of unemployment, that means that unemployment is going to be around 3%. Because of a portion of the structurally frictional or seasonal unemployment, or people find temporary unemployment, temporary employment. What does that mean? Well, in the short run, economies can run beyond the full level of output, beyond the LRAS. And when that happens, and the best example of this is in Christian countries where there's Christmas, where they celebrate Christmas. What happens at Christmas? People overspend. And have you ever seen, like, I mean, it's so funny here in Santiago. <laughs> you go to the store right before Christmas time, and they're like all these people in the aisles. They're working. All these people in the aisles dressed as Santa's elves. <laughs> and, and I'm like, whoa, what are you doing? You, you are an elf? And they're like giving you samples of like cookies, you know? And it's like some cookie company has hired some kid to stand in the aisle in an elf outfit to hand out free cookies so they will buy their cookies for Christmas morning. <laughs> and did you ever wonder where those people's jobs go after Christmas? Where are all the elves? The elves are gone because we go back to the regular level of natural rate of unemployment, which is 5%. So those kids who are, and they usually are like teenagers or university students, those kids don't have a job anymore. 
But for a short period of time, they did. And when they did, that meant that the unemployment rate was below 5%, okay, or 3%. Okay. Now, what about the other side? What about when there is maybe an inward shift of aggregate demand or an inward shift of the short run um, aggregate supply curve? What happens in this region? Well, check it out, Ellie Chagagis, man, you nailed it here. Absolutely nailed it, okay? So what's happening here? Well, there's gonna be a recession, that's true. That means that aggregate demand is down and there is going to be a recessionary gap. Unemployment rate is going to be greater than the natural rate of unemployment. Greater unemployment means above 8%, an increase in unemployment, right? There'll be cyclical unemployment in addition to the structural, frictional, and seasonal unemployment. Yeah, so in the pink section here, what does that mean? That means the pink section being this section right here, unemployment rates are going to be above 5%, right? There's going to be recessionary pressure. Over here, unemployment rates are going to be below 5%. And as a result of being below 5%, there's going to be inflationary pressure because those kids have a job and they're going to spend money, right? The elves are not going to save all their money. They're going to spend it maybe on cookies. Ah, oh, cookies because they already have cookies for free, probably. How many, uh, how many cookies does an elf eat in a day if they're handing them out for free? <laughs> I'd wanna know. All right, but nonetheless, right there, you have in this diagram an incredibly clear understanding of when you are using the neoclassical model, when unemployment, how to show, this is what we're doing, how to show when unemployment is below 5%, the natural rate of unemployment, and how to show when unemployment is above the natural rate of unemployment of 8%, okay? When aggregate demand moves in, unemployment goes up. When aggregate demand moves out, unemployment goes down. And we're rolling, 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 rolling on to the next video.